Hello and welcome to Surveyor Says, the podcast from the National Society of Professional Surveyors. Each week, we bring you fascinating guests that are involved in the profession of surveying. We cover a lot of ground, including Table Lay Talk with Gary Kent, Point of Order with the NSPS Joint Government Affairs Team, Future Focus, highlighting current and future leaders of the profession, and everything survey-related in between. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast and hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Surveyor Says. Hello and welcome to another edition of Surveyor Says. My name is Tim Birch and my guest today uh, is actually a very special guest. Uh, she, She's been around the surveying world for uh, for a number of years, and uh, she actually just retired from East Tennessee State University as a longtime educator. Um, it is the one and only Dr. Marion Young, and uh, Dr. Young, I appreciate you being on. And uh, so, one, how does it feel to be retired? And two, how did you get into surveying, I guess? Well, Tim, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, and the greater surveying community today. Um, I got interested in surveying sort of through my mom. She had a fascination with what she called silly maps. And we would have them hanging like most people had artwork in the living room, but they were like the New Yorker's version of the United States or the Floridian version of the United States. And the section where New York was or where Florida was, was pretty good map. And the rest of the world was kind of chaotic. And so she would teach me what the truth was. For example, in the Floridian map at the end of Florida, which took up 90% of the page, it said, this is the Mason-Dixon line, do not cross, there's nothing beyond here. So everybody was just supposed to stay in Florida on that particular version of the world. And then for the New Yorkers idea, I grew up in the city of Indianapolis, and it was north of us, way in Minnesota with Minneapolis, because those were the twin cities. Uh, St. Paul wasn't in the picture, you know, Indianapolis had become the second part of the twin. So my apologies to St. Paul, but in the New Yorker's <laughs> version of that particular map, <laughs> that's the way things were. Um, there was a state called no Reno, and a city called Nevada, because Reno, of course, had to be more important than the state. Sure. So it's bigger, <laughs> because <laughs> that's where, you know, vacations might have happened for 1930s, 1940 New Yorker folks. Wow. But after that, then I got into forestry and conservation with the BS degree from Purdue University. And one of the few courses that I got an A in was the intro course in survey. So I thought, oh. Maybe I can raise my GPA and, you know, do a few more surveying courses. Well, all the other surveying courses were in the civil engineering department. I didn't know what a big difference it was between forestry and surveying and forestry and civil engineering. It's like, wow, okay. <laughs> so I went over there and I took two courses. One I took pass-fail and passed it only because I took it pass-fail. And the other one I flunked. So the A from my surveying course in forestry and the F from the one in civil kind of averaged out to my C, which is what I was getting in most other things. So I still graduated. But years later, when students would come to me and say, I just don't get this surveying stuff, then I would say to them, OK, I flunked it once. Let's see what we can do for you. It always set them off guard. Sure. Um, after the graduation in forestry, I worked various different jobs for the Girl Scouts in northern Indiana and in Logansport area. And then I worked in southern Indiana on the Brookville Dam doing surveying for a final asbelt survey. And one of the reasons I got the job was because I knew how to throw a chain. We didn't have a reel to roll the tape up on. We just had to throw the chain, the five foot lengths and all that stuff. Well, that and the three classes in college got me the job. And nice. we had a dump bubble for elevations and we had a four post transit with a plumb bob swinging on the breezes mm -hmm. for all of our animals. And everything that we had to write down got written in a field book that had carbon papers because we were really working for the Corps of Engineers through the construction company. And the original papers would tear out of the field book and we had to do our computations from the carbon papers. 
So mm. sometimes they were unlegible and we had to request the originals back just to clarify things. But that job I had uh, between my undergrad degree and then summer after I didn't, you know, the surveying part of the construction project was finished and they wanted me to do some other things. And it sounded more like an accounting job than a surveying job. And I said, no, not really. Mm. So I went back to the college town where Purdue is up there in West Lafayette, Indiana, and ran into my former surveying professor that I had gotten the A from. And he goes, what are you doing? And I said, well, nothing come fall. I mean, I've got a job now, but I won't have one in the fall. And he goes, well, do you want to help me teach the course you took? Well, the job interview consisted of me retaking the final exam that I had taken um, two or three years earlier when I had his class. Well, I'd gotten an A the first time, as I mentioned, but mm -hmm. I got a C the second time with no prep and no background and no, you know, refreshing. And it's like, well, he says, well, you've remembered enough to keep the job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... I got that job and started teaching. Well, there was 150 students broken into groups of 30 for five teams of field time. We had one hour a week for lecture, which he gave to all 150 students. And then there were groups of 30 twice a week, might have been 7.30 in the morning or about 1.30 in the afternoon, the labs would start. And each group of 30 would come two days a week. So that was a lot of time in the labs helping the students learn how to do their surveying. I was in charge of doing, does this crew have the right field work equipment and how are they doing with collecting the data? And then if it was a rainy day and we were in the side, we were then computing the data. It's just coaching, sure. the basic thing, leveling, turning angles, doing a small traverse, doing a small topo there near the building where the equipment was. And so that was how I got started teaching. Well, about five or six weeks into the class, I had learned everybody's name, 150 kids. And my mind says, take a note here. That's a talent. Not very many people can do that. Mm -hmm. And I had come from a family of teachers. Both grandparents on both sides had teaching in their history. My maternal grandmother was a one-room schoolhouse teacher. And she always said, you should be a teacher. My mother, her daughter, said, you don't have to be a teacher just because Granny says. So I decided to stay out of the family <laughs> feud, thinking I'm <laughs> being a teacher. My father's family had owned the Clark College of Commerce down in Louisville, Kentucky, and went through the Depression. And then he was working there, helping the family teach typing, shorthand, bookkeeping, uh, business skills when he went to World War II in the Army. So he had helped teach, and his parents had started the college, and his brother and sister, everybody in the family did the teaching part. So, you know, as a child growing up with three teachers in the house, both parents and the grandparents, it's like, well, you know, whenever I had a question, it was always uh, answered by somebody. And whoever I was closest to, maybe, or whoever had that particular expertise, but there was never an opportunity for saying, no, I don't know the answer to that one. So when I learned all 150 students' names, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe you are good at something finally, because I was still trying to figure out what I was going to do sure. in life. And, you know, it was always one of those things, is like, we don't know. So I worked there for a long time with Mr. Blind in the agri agriculture program teaching that course in surveying. And he encouraged me to go across campus to the engineering program and work on the master's degrees. As if you really like this teaching stuff, you really need your master's. So I had to go back to the gentleman who flunked me <laughs> to get permission to start the <laughs> master's program. Like, hmm, yes, well. And fortunately, he was a forgiving instructor and he was willing to give me a second chance. And he goes, so, are you serious now? Are you going to do your homework? <laughs> right. That's really what the problem had been. It's, it's not that I couldn't do the work. It's that I was too busy doing other stuff. And, and that class was on the, at the bottom of the pile and didn't get the attention it needed. So those were the kind of basic getting started and in, in, in getting started in uh, doing the master's uh, work. 
Um, he had to put me on probation because I didn't have a 3.0 GPA. I only had six. And he goes, now, this first semester, you have to be in the state. So it's like, okay, no pressure there. 15 credit hours, five classes, and teaching the course with Mr. Blind. It's like, okay, sure. So it's definitely an overload semester, but I did manage to get the exactly 3.00, you know, <laughs> GPA <Yeah>. that was required <laughs> and was able to stay in the program. Um, two years later, I was finished with the master's degree there at Purdue. So now I have my bachelor's in forestry and my master's in civil engineering, and I'm looking for a job teaching. And there was a position open in California. I don't recall which school in California. And we did this telephone interview because this is 1977. Mm -hmm. And nobody flies unless you absolutely have to because they don't have that kind of money for interviews. And so we did the telephone interview, and basically they were looking for somebody with a master's degree and 20 years of field experience as a professional surveyor mm. or somebody who had a Ph.D. in education. And I looked at the Ph.D. and how long that would take, and I looked at the 20 years, and I figured the <laughs> Ph.D. was faster. Yep. <laughs> it was about eight years total to get the Ph.D. They said they could do it in three, but I just... just right. I don't know how that works. <laughs> right. And so we got the PhD eventually. And the folks in California said, when you finally have the education or some more field experience, call us back. We might still be interested in talking to you about teaching. Well, the places that I could have gone for the PhD were Purdue, which is where I already was, University of Wisconsin Madison or the Ohio State program there in uh, Columbus, Ohio. The requirements for PhD programs at that time was that you had to have a foreign language and the language that was the language of, quote, science and doing research was French, German, and Russian. Mm. And Ohio State required one of them. Well, I didn't know those languages, I knew Spanish. Since Purdue and Wisconsin were willing to take my Spanish, I went with that option. And they both accepted me, but folks said it was better to have the third degree from a different school. So I went to Madison. And that was good. <clears throat> um, I was there about seven years on campus doing the classes that needed to be taken, doing some research, bits and pieces, trying to figure out what I was going to do because I had no clue when I started. And that's part of the reason it took so long. Sure. <clears throat> I eventually did a thing on where to locate your solar collector so that the solar collector would be having good access to sunlight and that you could have one on your house and the neighbor could have one on their place and the community could be all solar collectors if they chose to have them. Sure. So <clears throat> after about seven years in Madison, I was finished with all my classes, but I was still working on writing the thesis. And there was a position open at the University of Missouri, Columbia. One of their teachers, um, Joe Piva, which many of you know, yep. was on sabbatical. Yep. And uh, he says, uh, you can come down here and teach for me for this year. And I said, OK. So he interviewed me as his replacement and decided that I knew enough to teach the basic courses that he had been teaching for that next two semesters, fall and spring. At the end of that year, he, of course, returned to the position that he had, and I took a position at a nearby university at Lincoln University there in Jefferson City, Missouri, and taught there for another year, some surveying, some CAD, and then there was one course in electronics. I don't know why they gave me a course in electronics. I had taken physics, and that was all I knew about electronics was physics. But <clears throat> with a lot of reading and stuff, um, I managed to teach some basics of electronics. During my time at Jeff City, as I applied it to come to East Tennessee State University and was accepted here in August of 1986. And so, as they say, the rest is history. I was here for, for the duration until May here of 2020. The summer of 1988, I did work in Dunkirk, New York with Woodbury and Strait Surveying Company. Miss Wendy Strait was the owner and her brother, Randy Woodbury, uh, worked there with about 10 total people. They teased me about being the help from down south since I had come from Tennessee to New York for the summer. Uh, but 
that was an enjoyable summer and they did primarily boundary surveys and then they had one larger construction project along the shore of Lake Erie there. But that was an enjoyable summer and learned some more about field experience and that sort of thing. And that helped me get the license eventually. Well, so that's kind of the nutshell version of how I got into surveying and what I did after I was there. Well, it's it's always interesting to hear the various ways. Um, just uh, as people have heard me say, I'm I'm a second generation surveyor, so uh, having to follow it, you know, in my dad's footsteps for for several years to get get uh, acclimated, and that's the way. Obviously, I mean, a lot of people are getting. We're you know, back in the day, we're we're getting into surveying. It's always Absolutely. interesting. You know, always interesting to hear from a different perspective and that's what uh, what what intrigued me about uh, about your story and uh, and and how you came into this um wh one of the things i really wanted to ask you because of your initial experiences you talk about chains and and uh, four post transits and various things and then up until recent days the when i when I when I say you know when I ask people about their changes in surveying philosophy and how the subjects change within surveying, I mean it used to be that it was you were so dependent on that field work, and that was I mean what was done in the field was I mean that was the work, and the notes were basically a report of that. Now we we, we fast forward to the computer age, and so much stuff is calculated beforehand, and then staked out in the field and such. I guess I'm curious from a teaching perspective, uh, how how has has the the computer age changed uh, how you had to had to, to to teach surveying and even the even some of the basics. Well, <clears throat> the one thing that doesn't change is geometry is still geometry. You know, triangles have three sides, rectangles have four uh, ninety degree corners. So some of those things are not going to shift around. And however you have to do the understanding of those basics, <clears throat> whether you do that by using a pencil and paper and draw the rectangle on a sheet of paper, or you do it in a computer and have the CAD program assist you with drawing that rectangle, it still needs to be 10 feet by 30 feet or whatever the size of that one happens to be. So the geometry hasn't changed. That was made very apparent to me after uh, I ended up retaking a course that I had taken in my master's program in digital photogrammetry so that I could teach some of the newer aspects of photogrammetry because I had been teaching some of the basics of photogrammetry, but some of the newer technology and software and all had gotten out, you know, out in front of where I knew anything about it. So I ended up going back to Purdue and taking the same course, but online version of it. And <clears throat> all of the software was different. All the way the data was collected was different, but the actual geometry, when you finally got down to that ray of light goes through the lens and to the ground. And that means that this particular location is at this X, Y, Z, 3D coordinate that hadn't changed. Right. So I found it fascinating right. that the software and the data collection systems and all of the tools were different, but the final result was still points on the ground in 3D space. Exactly. So that's what I mean by saying the geometry doesn't change. Good. But having to learn lots of new software, yes, and having to learn lots of new ways of showing the students, okay, let's do this particular little thing, let's do that particular little thing, whatever, um, to try to help people understand what's going on with the geometry. That for sure has all changed. That's great, because that's part of what I wanted to just see. Because you, you've covered enough in your career that, uh, yeah, you've seen a radical change from laying stuff out with a steel tape and transit to to total stations to robotic total stations to GPS and such. That uh, right. it, but you're right, and that's that's a great message right there for anybody that's listening. The geometry still doesn't change. The whole basics and the premise of the surveying and those points does not change. The tools we're right. using, they have changed. But uh, that's that's I, yeah, that's what I was curious on. Uh, so then I then the question I always like to ask ask people that have experienced uh, 
the, the radical change in technology? <laughs> are we going in the right direction with the technology or are we just, or for the most part, are we establishing a bunch of button pushers? Well, <clears throat> button pushers, yes, because that's part of what you have to be able to do. But if you think about what young people are being exposed to, at what age do they get to touch their cell phone for the first time? Right. I was in college helping Professor Blind teach when I picked up my first handheld calculator. He had purchased some HP 21 machines, 10 of them for the students to use, kind of like you check them out like a library card, 10 hour, two hour checkout. And then he also purchased an HP 71 so that he and I as professors could double check and have a little bit more, you know, package because the higher the number, there was more stuff inside the calculator. Mm -hmm. But they had little magnetic strips that looked like the strips on the back of your credit card that would run through the machine and do a particular program. Like it would might do the sign uh, function for solving a triangle, or it might do a different strip would do the cosine function for solving a triangle. And a different one might be uh, a five-sided traverse and doing the adjustment for a five-sided traverse. You know, and different strips would program that particular calculator to do those different functions. But you could only do that one function if you want to do the sine law and the cosine law and the traverse. Then you had to right. be, you had to know what you were doing first, second, and third because you had to put the strips in, you know, and then you had to repunch in. It didn't save this angle and that <laughs> distance and the other. So you had to punch all that stuff in again. So it, it's, it wasn't that HP wasn't doing what they needed to do. It's just that they hadn't put it all together in a total package yet. All right. Right. Yeah. You look back <laughs> at some of that stuff and you go, wow, how did we do that? Because, uh, you know, I remember I remember as a kid, uh, one of the first, one of my dad's big purchases was he bought a calculator with a sine cosine tangent function on it. And I mean, it was yes. expen it was expensive. Um, but he would, yes. and he showed me, he, you know, this is going to replace this big, thick book and I can just punch this in right. and give me the number rather than looking it up every time. And right. yes. So it's like, wow. Yeah. Those log in place logarithmic, uh, tables for doing your trig functions and doing your multiplications and divisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We did all of that. Yeah. We had to dig, you know, one of my professors said, now, if this calculator dies and your batteries and you don't have extra batteries, what you need to do is you need to take this book with you in the field so that you can still do the computations and you don't have to come back to the office. Well, you know, people decided that taking six extra pairs of batteries was easier than carrying that big book. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But um, he was thinking that maybe the batteries would die and maybe the equipment also would die. Is it was what he was hedging against. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, you know, and one thing that, uh, you know, it, it, it can be a touchy subject in various places, but I mean, in, where you've been in the edu in the higher education, how has it been uh, the, your, the student body as far as a male, female mix and and uh, diversity in races? I mean, it, I mean, when you're talking 150 students at Purdue, uh, how much of a how much of a mix was it back then? Was there very many women getting involved at that point in time? That was in the forestry department, and we had, I think, two teams of four ladies each out of 150. But then that forestry department versus predominantly men also. Sure. Um, one semester here at ETSU. Uh, one of the intro classes, of course, was the intro to CAD and mapping. And there were five young ladies in the class that particular fall semester. And I walked into class and I thought, oh, we've got a revolution going. <laughs> <laughs> Several of them are still in uh, professional surveying. I, did, I wasn't able to keep up with all of them, but I know that at least two of those five still are doing surveying as a profession. So. I don't know if 40% is a good retention rate for young ladies, but I know for that particular group of five, um, that never happened a second time. It didn't happen the following year, so I don't know. We have had 
folks of other races in the program, Hispanic and uh, African American. Um, there were a couple students who came up from um, the Bahamas. Okay. Uh, one was a young lady and one was a gentleman. And they have come and taken courses here at ETSU and both of them are back home. Um, young ladies working with her uncle's company. I saw her on LinkedIn not very long ago. And the young man was here back in May or June. I was here cleaning my office out, sorting papers and stuff. Not one of my favorite tasks. <laughs> and uh, he, his uh, wife came through and I got to see both of them. And when they had been here, they had been here with several of their younger children. The children are now all grown and in college and did, did not travel with them for that particular visit. But it was good to see uh, him and his wife and kind of catch up with how they're doing. He's working for the government of the Bahamas. I'm not sure which major island he focuses sure. on, but he's with government service down there. So we have had occasions of uh, ladies in the program and folks of other nationalities, other races in the program, but it's not the common. I mean, right. the majority of the folks are uh, young men and mostly of white ethnicity. Well, and let me let me ask you this also that we're talking about the changing in technology. We're talking about different ways of going about doing surveys and the different aspects of surveying. You know, and this is part of what I right. think. I think what, especially from NSPS's perspective, that uh, you know, you know, going back to even to your experiences being out in the field early on with the chain and transit. I mean, it was a physical job and it's not that it's not a physical job at times now, but there's so many aspects of surveying now that are technical, that are uh, analyzation and uh, just, it's not just out, you know, the old uh, description of, you know, cutting line and, 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 and running traverses through the woods. There's a little bit of everything for sur for people in surveying now and we really need to make sure that we we make those doors open for for all genders and races to be able to to come in and learn learn this this fantastic profession of surveying. Correct. Yeah, it's. Um, I remember what, talking to one of the local professionals when I was first here in Tennessee at one of the local meetings, and he said, "If I if all I'm doing is standing behind the tripod." I'm out of business. There's a lots of other things that need to happen in addition to the field data collection. Right. And the field data collection, we need the data because we have to have something to analyze. But once the analysis part of the task begins, it's like, okay, you found this particular corner marker. Is it in the right place? Is it the one that the original surveyor described when they wrote the deed? Um, sometimes you can tell by the age of the deed that the marker that you're looking at probably isn't the original. Right. And therefore, was it put back in the original location or is it been shifted around or was somebody doing something nefarious and purposely moved it? You just don't know. But those are all things that's part of the analysis. And then when you look at the analysis for like photogrammetry or some of these uh, cloud images for, that you would get from some of the drones and some of those other places that cloud images come from, you're like, okay, I can see that I'm representing this housing district or this school or this, you know, right. federal building or whatever the images are of. But when you look at the legal part of that, you know, is it in the right place? You know, are the records associated with that parcel correct? There's a lot of other things that go with all of the analysis. So we do have to focus on both sides of the fence. And although my expertise was in the mathematics and the, you know, the geometry and the, is it in right. the right place and can you prove it mathematically proof? The other side of the fence it's probably more more trouble to a, a practicing professional. It's like what what keeps you up at night? <laughs> the fact that you didn't close, yes. you know, you know, only an inch away. 
that closure probably doesn't keep you up at night. Right. The idea of the neighbor on the other side of the fence is suing you might keep you up at night. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. So those are things that, that definitely there's a there's a depth of the profession that is not apparent immediately. Right. Well, with all of the students that have come through your classes, is there any particular attribute that what you'll say, some of your better students, was there a commonality that they uh, they were able to really f- grasp the geometry part of it or grasp uh, some of the surveying basics? Um, anything that really stood out that uh, that makes a good surveyor out of out of those that student body? Folks who like puzzles usually do better because if you can put together, okay, how do you solve this, whether it's a logic puzzle or whether it's one of those geometry type puzzles or it's one of those video games like Tetris or some of those kind of things, those right. woodblock things that back all this stuff in to these boxes and does this shape fit here? And anybody that can do those kind of puzzles has a potential aptitude for being a surveyor. Right. Because some of our some of our puzzles are solved by doing the geometry side of it, but many of our puzzles are doing the logic of, okay, Joe originally owned this piece of property and he sold it to his brother Sam, and then the Smith family bought it. Mm-hmm. But somewhere in there, something isn't quite right. And and what you find in the record. You just get this gut feeling that there's more than what you see in the record to meet the eye. And so you have to become like a detective right? to figure out, oh, well, when Joe sold it to his brother, his brother was, you know, running drugs on the property or something and used the back (laughs) 40 for, you know, a a storage area, you know, and he's got little tracks all plotted out there and, you know, things hidden in the ground and you never know what you're going to run into. Uh, whether it's that or whether it's the marijuana farm or whether it's whatever <laughs> yeah. you run into. I mean, here in Tennessee, we have all kinds of opportunities for it could be an illegal still or it could be a marijuana farm here in these mountains. Sure. And uh, sure. <laughs> folks take caution. And, you know, sometimes you take your shotgun also in addition to your caution. And you may need the shotgun for the wildcat. You might not need it for a human, but. At least you have it if you need it. Right. So I guess to hearing, hearing your enthusiasm, talking about these, these students and such, what was your favorite subject to teach within the, the surveying curriculum? Uh, what, what, what did you really like to, to, uh, to dig into with the students? The courses that I primarily enjoyed teaching were the ones in the geometry side of things. There was the course called adjustment computations, which the students hated because they had lots of extra homework. <laughs> because in order to really understand what's going on with least squares adjustments, you need to know several different parts of mathematics. You need to know trig and coordinate geometry, which most surveyors understand. You also need to know something of statistics. You need to know something of partial derivatives from calculus, and you need to know how to put it all together with linear algebra so you can put all five of those different math courses together at the same time. When I went to other meetings here on campus, I would run into math professors and they'd say, what do you teach? And of course, we'd start talking. And eventually I would say, well, in order to teach the class I teach, the students have to do trig and calculus and statistics and Mm -hmm. linear algebra all in one question. And the math teacher stood there and said, that's five or six semesters. I said, no, that's one homework problem. <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and so I knew it was unique when the math teachers were saying that's five or six semesters. And I'm going, no, that's one homework problem. Right. So no the it took forever to figure out what I was really trying to tell them. Mm-hmm. The other course I really enjoyed teaching was the geodetic science course, which included the astronomy part where you can use that for determining longitude, latitude, and uh, azimuth, and you have to do spherical trig. 
Um, right. We recently had a Zoom meeting and some of the former students came in who are now working in the profession. And the one gentleman said, I really enjoyed the circles you drew on the board. Well, that was a skill that back when you had to draw on the chalkboard, mm -hmm. you had to be able to draw reasonably good geometry so that, you know, if you say that this line over here is a vanishing point for this edge of the house, they kind of have to look like they connect. <laughs> Right. So if you're saying this sphere here starts with this circle and this is the outer edge of the circle and here's the equator and here's the North Pole and here's the star and here's where I'm standing on the earth, my zenith above my head. And this is the spherical triangle that we're going to pull out of this sphere. It kind of has to look like a spherical triangle. So he commented at the retirement party about drawing nearly perfect circles on the chalkboard. <laughs> and it was a thing that I watched one of my other professors when I was doing my master's work. I, I got it from a, a gentleman down in Purdue who drew circles. And what you do is you start at the bottom of the circle with a piece of chalk and you kind of use your elbow as the center radius and you go up and around. And it's not a perfect circle unless you practice, but it's enough that it gives you the illusion of a circle. Nice. Nice. But I enjoy teaching, you know, the, the geometry stuff and, and the math stuff. Well, and I tell you what, just sitting here listening to you explain it, uh, I can hear the enthusiasm. And it, it yes, it would have been a lot of, lot of hard work, but, uh, it, I, you know, I can only imagine, you know, well, as a student sitting in there, it probably didn't sound enthusiastic at the time, but, uh, <laughs> <Probably not. laughs> uh, but, you know, the fact that uh, this is something this is you're very passionate about. It was just that just it thr it thrills somebody like me to hear you to hear you be able to talk about it and go, you know, I really enjoy doing that because uh, it's it, we need we need to figure out ways to 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 to, to get joy from things. And uh, uh, obviously you did when you were teaching these classes. Um, right. I guess. Listen. So listening to that um, and, and hearing some of the, 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 the common themes going forward. What do you what do you think about the future of surveying? I mean, where where are we going as far as technology and being able to teach uh, the the next generation of students and and really what what they're going to need to know going forward? I mean, I, I like that you've established. I mean, yes, geometry doesn't change; it is what it is. Um, but what do you think is going to be really really critical for them to know going? going forward for the next generation or two? Well, as we've said, locations and geometry don't change. But the other thing is, because the software might change, because the hardware might change, because the manufacturer who used to be an independent manufacturer has now joined forces with another manufacturer and they're trying to merge two different uh, systems for total stations, and some of the commands from one might get mixed in with some of the commands from the other, mm -hmm. the professional surveyor has to not be afraid of changes. Now, right. changes is one of those things where we all like to get stuck in our happy little rut. <laughs> yes. If you, attend, for example, church services, do you always sit towards the front left side about halfway back? Or if you go to a theater concert, in, and you have your choice of chairs, where would you pick? Do you mm -hmm. want to be down front so that you can't hear when you walk out of the concert? Or do you want to be about halfway back so that you can still hear and that you can watch the people in front of you, And but then there's also people behind you? Or do you want to sit in the last row so that you can watch everybody coming in and going out and, you know, half pay attention to what's on stage and half pay attention to everything else going on in the crowd? We all are creatures of habit. But as surveyors, we can't stick with, for example, we're no longer using chain very much, except maybe on a construction layout that's less than 100 feet mm -hmm. because it's more accurate. And we're still not using chain because we like using chain. We're using chain because it gets the job done more, you know. Right. It's more precise than using a total station. Yes. And it reminds me of something my mother used to say. She said, when you drop a cat, they can land on their feet. No matter what direction you toss that cat, he's going to land on his feet. So 
as surveyors, when we see changes, we need to be like the cat and land on our feet. Look right. around, see what the new landscape looks like, and then try to move forward whatever the best way you think is possible. Going yeah. to the trade shows, talking to the uh, folks who sell software and equipment and asking hundreds of questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, the only stupid question is the one you never asked. Right. And I would tell my students that, you know, frequently we'd say, okay, if you don't understand something, there's two choices. You can either, you know, ask your friends who may not understand it any better than you do, or you can ask me. You know, I have officers, you know. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would tell them is that they'd say, well, I've got a question. I go, well, they pay me to answer questions, so we're good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's correct. You know, so they did. They paid me to answer questions. The other thing that I'm reminded of is a professional surveyor years ago when I was in Missouri, we were at a dinner. And he said, now I got a question. How can we convince your student that six, the, that 70 percent, a grade of C, is not a passing grade? And I said to him, well, give me a little bit more context to your question, and then I'll see how we can try to answer that. And he goes, if in my business I'm only 70 percent right, I'm in the courthouse defending everything that I did, and I'm not making any money. And I thought, hmm, yeah, okay. He goes, I have to be 999 percent correct most of the time if not all the time so that i can stay in business right and not have to be defending something that i did three years ago right because i don't get paid to go back to the project the second time and defend it in court most of the time if i'm going to court i'm paying something out <laughs> i'm either paying out my time or i'm paying out my fees or i'm paying out my people to send them to the court or I'm, you know, spinning my wheels looking for the old records that may or may not be in good order, you know. So I need to do it all correct the first time. Right. You know, and that's that's something I, I'm glad you say that because that's something that I also try to strive with some of our younger staff um, to always ask questions. Like you said, I'm. I, there's a lot of people that say I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not paid to, to answer questions from staff. No, yes, I am. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be doing the best job we can. So always ask questions. Um, but then mm -hmm. also, it, it's always you don't have to have every answer memorized. Just know where to find the answer. That's the big thing. Is to know where to find yes. it. Use the index right. of that book and find it. Uh, <laughs> so yes. So you, you hit it. I mean, I, I love that piece of advice that, you, you know, you do have to be correct, n not just 70 percent of the time. It is uh, 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 closest to 100 percent as you possibly can, because uh, that's just the way the business works. So I, I love that. Love yeah. that uh, that take on things. Um, well, we try to keep these into yeah. the 30, 30 to 40 minute range. I see, uh, any Anything uh, you want to throw out there for uh, personal observations on uh, looking back on a, on, on a fantastic career and uh, a wonderful profession? It is a good profession. For the most part, it's an honest profession. It, it doesn't have the same uh, connotations, for example, that some of your other car salesmen professions would have a potentially negative con you know, connotation. Right. The surveying profession has a code of ethics and, and I've never met someone who didn't follow that. I've heard of people on several boards asking questions. How do we coach this gentleman? Would you help them to have some classes that you can take online so that they can keep their license so that they can learn how to be a better individual? It was always in a context of coaching rather than in a context of reprimand. Right. And I always appreciated that, that, you know, we're, we're trying to help our fellow surveyors do quality work because the profession has a reputation. And so I've always appreciated that um, exactly. honesty and, and exactly. ethics and all those things that go with that kind of scenario. Um, that striving for excellence, um, part of that 99% thing we're talking about here just a few minutes ago. I saw a sign at the car repair dealer years ago and it says if you don't have time to do it right the first time 
when are you going to find time to do it over? Right. So it's <laughs> those kind of things. Yep. Um, exactly. So no, that's that. That's a good point too, because, uh, yeah, you really need to take the time and do it right the first time, because yeah, it's, uh, and. and you know, it's really too bad because in this day and age, I mean, your reputation is is uh, is worth a lot, and it, uh, it like and like you said, it's it's a very honorable pr profession that uh, you'd hate to not live up to the to the uh, basically the reputation of the entire profession. And uh, but no, that's that's great. I like that. I like that a lot. So it reminds me of the the folks who were on the mountain at Mount Rushmore, uh, presidents, three of them were surveyors. Mm -hmm. So we've got a honorable history also. And I like that quote on the bottom of the poster. I saw it says three surveyors and one other guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that poster for Mount Rushmore or not. Oh but yes, absolutely. Yeah. Those, yeah. those three. I thought that was pretty good. Yep. And as my wife always reminds me when she sees that, and then she says, yeah, I know, three surveyors and another guy. She says, you know why Roosevelt's up there? Because he had money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, now, <laughs> in, so. in smaller communities here in near campus, but in the mountains, I mean, there might be 500 people that live in that town. Mm -hmm. One of the surveyor's students who got licensed and went home to work in his hometown community. That first year, he had $100,000 of money go through his business. Now, that wasn't his take-home cut. That was the right. entire business. Right. But for a small community business in a small town to be working with those large numbers, he was general. Yes. So, you know, wife might not have seen as much of the money as she would have liked to have seen, right. but I'm sure that you all did well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, well, Dr. Young, I appreciate you being on. And uh, this has been this pleasure. I, I knew I, I knew once Kurt suggested to, to get in touch with you and and uh, hear the whole story of, of, of everything you've been through would be really fascinating. And, and you have not disappointed. I I uh, I I just wish I would have had had a chance earlier in my career to have come cross paths with you and and to have done done some things with you but uh uh we wish you the best in your retirement hopefully uh you've got plenty of things to do uh in in the in the coming years and uh uh if there's anything we can ever do for you just let us know as well well i couldn't stand the idea of not being in school so i took a class oh you t it's in digital videos <laughs> So I may be creating some games in the near future. There you go. I don't know exactly where that's going to go, but um, I'm learning something new here. And so we'll see how that pans out. I don't know yet, but that that's that's where, where some of my in interest is currently going. Well, in a tr in true surveyor fashion, you're never yeah, stop learning. Here. Right, right. Or just gossip. Right. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity. Well, we appreciate you being on, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again that's somewhere true. down the road. I'm sure that's true. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to the Surveyor Says Podcast, brought to you by the National Society of Professional Surveyors. If you have any questions about today's episode or any other topic, please email us at info at nsps.us.com, and we are here to help. Visit our website, nsps.us.com, to learn more about our association, the programs we administer and support, our sustaining members, and information about future episodes of Surveyor Says. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, as well as our podcast host, Podbean. And remember, it's a great day to be a surveyor. Surveyor.